Welcome to the Landscape Photography Vlogcast. Join me, Mr. Ferto Ninja, and Mr. Paul Thompson Photography from YouTube. Every Sunday morning at 10am for everything photography related. And also look out for some special guests. Grab yourself a brew, beer, or something stronger, and let's get into this week's vlogcast. Right, welcome to the podcast, Matt. Thanks, you want to tell us, uh, sorry about last time. <laughs> <laughs> That's all right, mate. <laughs> uh, do you want to tell uh, do you want to tell me a little bit about you? Because uh, I was the only one that weren't there last time. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God, there's not that much to tell, really. Um, I've sort of just been, you know, a hobbyist landscape photographer up until about five or six years ago. I've been shooting since uh, about 2002, 2003. Yeah. And I just basically bought a camera back then just because I just moved over to Europe and I wanted to capture the landscape. So I was blown away by the diversity of the landscapes with respect to Australia and just started getting into it. And I probably just sort of lost the plot with the passion in sort of recent years. Um, Unfortunately, my wife got sick about... uh, Oh, about 10 years ago, and I kind of used that as a, as a therapy, I suppose, to help me get yeah. over what she went through. And and then I just got more and more into it. I just progressed ever since, and um, I've just let it sort of flow organically. I've never been one to sort of try and push, my, push myself on on social media. I've just, um, just let it flow organically and just enjoy photography for what it is. Yeah. I, I reckon that definitely definitely comes out on your images um because obviously i've like like Paul, i've i've followed your stuff for a while now and um i was showing i was showing my partner your uh instagram feed mm-hmm. um because that's what we do as photographers it's, it's the instagram feed <laughs> and uh yeah she was she said to me um isn't he good at capturing light and i thought that was probably because she's not a photographer okay but that is something that she picked up, just you know, right. just just an average, just an, a normal viewer, shall we say? Mm. So yeah, mm. and I think that was quite that was quite cool to hear her say that because I definitely think you can capture you definitely capture the atmosphere and the light really well. Thanks, mate. Well, you know, as um, as an Australian photographer, you guys wouldn't have heard of. It was really famous back in the eighties, but he he said, if you don't have light, you don't have a landscape. Yeah. And, um, you know, yeah, that sort of sticks with you. Yeah, 100%, yeah. Mm, mm. Yeah, that's not a bad way to go. Yeah, there we, there we have this um, light versus comp- uh, composition discussion, or do we not? <laughs> <laughs> We've been down this rabbit hole before. Let's go for it. It's always valid, isn't it? <laughs> it is indeed. So, so obviously, obviously you're a light man. What is it about what is it about light that makes you point your camera at? Well, you know, I think when you're out shooting a sunrise or sunset or you're up on the mountains and you're shooting a beam of light coming through a storm or something, it's that moment you're capturing that everyone else, and when I mean everyone, I mean people that aren't photographers, they they're not going to get to see. They're either in bed or they're on the couch playing PlayStation or or doing what they do. And I think it's good to be able to capture those moments and actually showcase those moments to to people who don't normally see them. I mean, Mm. I think in, you know, the social media society we're in now, the majority of people that we try and focus on you know, the, our audience, uh, other photographers. Yeah. I think that's wrong a lot of the times because we should show these people these this beautiful light that norm, people, these people that normally don't get to see it. And I think that's yeah, a yeah. beautiful moment to be able to capture that. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, it's funny. I never really thought of it like that. But that, mm. that kind of sums up what I was just saying about my, um, my partner noticing it in your pictures. Mm. Maybe she's okay. not used. She's not used to seeing light like that. She's not used to seeing it. Could be. Yeah. It could be true. You know. I think mm. we're so contaminated by 
I don't know how many trillions of images are taken per second per day and we're just bombarded with with images now and um, I think it's important to sort of to be able to capture that that raw moment that people aren't capturing with their phones you know and yeah um, and try and get that across to those people I I really really um, I really want to get that across to to people not so much photographers but um you know the general audience and um it's a beautiful thing to be able to to be able to put that across to people and it's funny when you do you always get people saying to me oh you photoshopped the hell out of that <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> <laughs> That's the only thing they know how to answer. They see yeah. something beautiful and they think you photoshopped the hell out of it. And that, unfortunately, that's what photography's come to now. You know, yeah. we've moved into this, um, I call it N North American populist movement. It's like, um, you know, um, everything's transitioned in a certain way with digital photography over the last few years. There's been a big movement of the photographers that have pushed photography to a certain level. Um, I don't want to mention names, but, you know, I can sure you guys can imagine the people that I'm talking about that, that push these images to such a limit that people, I think the general public actually a lot of the time see them and just think, ah, that's impossible. And it actually is impossible. Yeah. So I think it's yeah. nice to be able to capture those quiet moments with that beautiful light and and um, and give value to what you actually what you capture because that that the value in that image might one day still stand out you know and have yeah. value i think it will i think i think it has lent <laughs> it has um it has um time has time on its side i think i think it will come round you know like trends do don't they well, definitely, definitely. After the International Landscape Photography Awards this year, it's a lot of people have. Um, of oh, the thing has been a bit of anger out there. I shouldn't say anger because I mean, at the end of the day, that's 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 the decision of the awards. They've decided to go that that direction. But a lot of people have have sort of stood up and said, "Hey, you know, what about us?" And I think, yeah, like you said, it's. I think it's going to come back around. You know this. Eyewitness movement is is going to come back. Yeah, I hope it does because I think Hopefully. a photo has got a lot more value when it is an eyewitness moment. A lot of people yeah. put so much effort into going back to the same location many, many, many times to get a better composition, better light, yeah. and to actually give value to that that image that was actually taken because so much work went behind it. Yeah. It's so easy just to put a filter on on an image or or do a composite and spend a few hours on Photoshop and just make it unrealistic and, and um, yeah, I'm sort of really, really sort of moving in that direction. I played with popular, let's call it this populist type of photography for a while just to actually gain more popularity it wasn't for me, but that was after a while. I was like, you know what? I'm just not, it's not me. I actually don't feel like I'm true. Yeah. To, yeah. To the public when I do this. Um, yeah. I don't know about you guys. I was, you know, probably about four or five years ago, I was like, how are these guys doing it? They're just kicking ass out there. And so I started buying, you know, some of these guys, um, you know, their post production. Um, tutorials just to see if there was something extra that they were doing that I that I wasn't and yeah. there was and I didn't like what I was seeing and so recently I've just sort of thought that's good I actually know where I want to be and I know what I know that I want to be true to public and I try as much as I can to do that yeah and I see you guys are very much similar in your photography too so it's great that we can speak on a on a on a on a similar level. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, my, yeah. Like taking it too far, that's for sure. Yeah. No, I do find myself being more trying to be more subtle now. I've noticed um, that. I've noticed yeah. that. Yeah. I do try to be, yeah. Uh I, do, I get more enjoyment out of trying to make it um I think I find it more challenging to actually try I think it's more challenging to, to make an image look how your eye saw the scene at that moment in time. It is. 
or bring yes. out or trying to enhance something that was already there than it is to learn a technique um, and, and crank them saturations and contrasts all to the right. Mm. Yeah, it would get a lot of likes on Instagram, but only for three seconds and then someone's onto something else anyway. So Look, the, amount, the amount of work that actually goes into actually getting a raw file, and if you know what you're doing and you try hard and you dig deep into that raw file, there's so much information in that raw file that you can pull out and bring an image back to life the way it yeah. was you saw it with that raw data, it's just so much more rewarding. Yeah, 100%, um, yeah. I find that in my workshops. Mm. Uh, I would say, oh, eight out of ten people I take out. I, I always, I always, I know we're obviously taking an image, but I do tend to um, teach, it's, you, you take, you're, you're trying to record data mm. when you're there. Um, yeah. And people don't seem to, they don't even think about that. They just think oh, I'm taking a picture. But you, the raw file is. I know it's an. I know it's an image, but it, it's 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 light to dark data. Mm. And you know, if the more you get in there, the the you know the more you've got in your pocket when you go into the, into Lightroom or Photoshop or whatever you do. Mm. Um, I think there's a lot more thought in it from start to finish if you think of it like that. Whereas most people don't. They just think I'll. Oh, I'll take that picture there and I'll do the rest later on. Yeah. And, yep. um, yep. yeah, yep. there's a lot less, there's, there's a lot less thought process goes into just do it now. I think. Yeah. yeah. Look, I, um, I like, as, as I spoke to you guys before more offline, I don't like bringing up names, but I know a photographer out there that I recently looked at and reflected off this person's work and actually saw this person, was doing something online while on one of their workshops. And I saw them just pull out their camera with a group of photographers around and just pull the camera straight out of the bag and went, bang, got it, put the camera back in the bag and walked off. And then when they got home, just spent hours on Photoshop just trying to, to, to bring something out of not much really. I mean, yeah, yeah, it's a shame. There's so much reward in setting up a composition, pulling your tripod out, waiting for the right light. And if it's not there, it's just not, that's part of the game. Come back another yeah. time or just don't take it. Or point your camera another direction and get something else. Yeah. yeah. Um, but to just sit in front of a camera and go, bang, got it, because you know later on you're just going to pull something out of nothing. It's just, yeah, I can't, I can't understand it. I can't understand it, but, you know, that, that that's me. I don't want to sound like an old school guy, but... It's um, it's unfortunately, yeah, a lot of it in the last couple of years has been going in this direction. But anyway, sorry, guys, yeah. I'm blabbering on about this too much. <laughs> That's all I've been thinking about lately. That's what lockdown has actually done to me. I've just reflected on everything so much. Yeah, yeah. And it's probably done. It's the, I think lockdown has actually done me some favours on reflecting. Yeah, <laughs> reflecting a lot. Reflecting yeah, yeah. on mistakes that I've done over the past, reflecting on um, people that um, you know that I wanted to collaborate with or or, or whatever, and, and uh, yeah, it's good to it's good to reflect and to yeah. and if you can be happy with where where you are and who you are and be true to yourself, I think that's the most that's the most valuable tool you can have as a landscape yeah. photographer at the moment. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. If you're, you're happy with what you're producing, then people will pick up on that. Eh? That's the way you yeah. look at it. Yeah, yeah, don't, I think so. Yeah. Don't go into it thinking that you're going to be popular just by doing something to make you popular. Get popular by doing what you want to do. I think yeah. that's that's the way. Yeah. Too many too many people shoot for Instagram likes, not for the light. <laughs> yeah, yeah, hundred yeah, percent. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. So, um, talking about you know normal life, I I hear you work at the hospital. I, I do, yeah. I'm yeah. a, I'm a how, operating theatre nurse. Yeah. Oh, how's it? How, how how do you how do you find time um, to do to do that to do you run your big workshops that you do like to Patagonia and um, post and print in and how do you find how do you do it all, mate? I just prioritise it. 
first I prioritise my family. Yeah. Um, when I walk out of the door, once I'm out of work, I don't think about work anymore. And um, I, um, you know, first, as I said, I've got two kids, two little boys and, and, and my wife. So family comes first and I just say to myself, okay, I've got those two hours left over and I might only be two hours in a week and I just make sure that those two hours I just dedicate to what I need to do. Um, with regard to pod, with with regard to sorry to, to workshops, you know, I've got a very supportive wife, and um, you know, obviously, I'm not a full time photographer, so I don't disappear um, for you know months per year. Uh, Patagonia, well, it, the plan was to do it once per year. Obviously, that's <laughs> we've had to put yeah. that to the side at the moment, but that was yeah. you know once per year, and and and. My wife supports me to do that. She knows that's a big passion for me and a couple other little local workshops that are around here, so just a weekend here and there. But um Yeah. It's not easy. It's not easy. And it's getting it's getting harder to find the time to to dedicate to that. But um I think if you've got that deep passion in you and you need it, you find the time. You have yeah. to. Whether it's you stay up at midnight and and work on an image till two in the morning or look a lot of the time on the weekends I've been on a project which I can't actually tell you guys about now but you'll find out about it soon um up until a fortnight ago before we you know before everything shut down here I had uh I had to be out every day for the whole entire week to get this to get this job done and then I needed about an extra 20 hours in post-production to finish this job off so I basically got up at 4.30 every single morning, went out, drove an hour, an hour and a half, knew where I was going, I planned it in advance, took the shots I needed, came home, spent, you know, put the kids to bed at 9.30, 10 o'clock and from 10 till 2 or 3 in the morning, worked on the computer and just, you know, like sleepers, we're going to sleep and we're dead, you know, there's no <laughs> point in- Hundred um, percent. Yeah, I'm exactly the same. When I, when yeah. I'm, I'm a bit all or ill. I'm, I'm every, everything is on black. <laughs> mm. Yeah, I, yeah. Mm. And, uh, whereas my my partner's sort of, oh, when ten o'clock's coming, she's you know she's made a cup of tea, she's going to bed, and mm. and I think, oh, I could get some work done. <laughs> this is the good time to get into it. Yeah, get yeah, yourself. Yeah. Get yourself a glass of wine or a, or, or a tea and, and, and get yeah. stuck into it. It's beautiful, isn't it? You get there, you put some music on, the headphones, and yeah, and just disappear for an hour or two and forget about everything. Yeah, yeah no, it's yeah. good, yeah. Mm. Yeah. So do you see yourself going for... Sorry, Paul. Was that? It's all right. I think we're all in the same boat there, aren't we? Cause yeah. All three, you, all three of us are asking that, mate. Yeah. We are. All in the same boat, yeah. yeah you got boys as well, probably, not you? Yeah, two. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> My head hurts. <laughs> yeah, I, I can imagine. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So, where do you where do you see where do you want to be? Do you want do, do you see yourself ever going full time, or are you, are you happy where you things are? Oh, I don't think I'd risk it at the moment no. because I don't think I'm capable of it. I think if I dedicated the time to it, I don't think it would be an issue. Um, you know, the, the market's so flooded with people out there doing workshops and stuff, but I think being, um, especially being in an Australian in Italy, especially in Italy, I think I've got the opportunity to be able to, to bring a lot of people here. I know a lot, yeah. of, a lot of places to go to. Um, I could take people on amazing tours. Um, yeah. I know all the restaurants to go to, the best places to eat when you go out after you go out for a day's shoot. I know all the locals everywhere. Um, I've had fantastic photographers in Italy show me some brilliant places and Italy's just full of places. I mean, yeah. even the same in Argentina. Argentina, for me, it's the same thing. As my best friend's got, he's got his own tour company there. So even in Argentina, uh, in Patagonia, there's so many people yeah. who do workshops in Patagonia, but the workshop I offer is just completely different. It's nothing mm. like it. And that's, I think if I put, if I had the time to dedicate to it, I could, but I wouldn't risk it. I've got a family, I've got two kids. Yeah. I've got a mortgage to pay. Um, I want to make sure my kids go to university and they've got, you know, the opportunities that I had. And 
especially with COVID coming now, it was a bit of a wake-up call because I did contemplate it for a while there. Um, but I'm, I'm happy just to, just to, just to, you know, just to do a couple of workshops here and there and keep the passion alive and, and let it feed. And uh, I would probably think about it again once the kids are a bit older. Yeah. 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 Let this yeah. whole movement sort of die over too because, yeah, the composition is just so high at the moment and I think things are going to rapidly change soon. It's not going to be the same in the next five years. No. Um, you've got to think that a lot of people out there who are – who are out there taking landscape photography for the moment. There's so many guys out there that are pushing themselves on social media, but they're 25, 27-year-old kids um, who've dedicated every single day for three years to, to photography and they're good at it because they've just had so much time and yeah. soon they're going to have kids, they're going to have a full-time job and they're not going to be able to do it anymore. And I think this movement's sort of going to change because of that. It's been a big sort of swarm of everyone just getting together and it's all sort of happening, but I think it will it will die off and only the the people that have been doing it for a longer period of time will be the ones that will survive and, and other people will come out who offer something different. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, I think that's true. I do, I do think that it's kind of survival of the fittest, people that are really passionate about it. Yeah, because a lot of the time, these people who just force themselves into it, if you spend every single day doing photography, post-processing, going out, I mean, you see people out there on Instagram, one week they're in Iceland, the next week they're in friggin' Tuscany, yeah. the next yeah. week after they're in Patagonia, you think, how the hell do they do it? Because they don't have any restrictions in their life at all. They don't have a job, they don't have a family. They've probably got mum and dad paying for their airfares. Yeah. Um, They've got all the new and the best gear um, and they can just go everywhere. And, um, you know, other people like me who have been just dabbing at it over the years, I think there's a less chance that someone like me will get burnout. Yeah. You know? Yeah. There's, there's that sort of that healthy approach towards it as, as a passion that sort of dabbing at it, I think you're going to survive longer. Yeah, I want to. I want to do it to the day I die, and because it, for me, it's it's such an important thing for me as a person, um, as as a, as a therapy. And um, I know you feel very similar, Paul, about you know, yeah, landscape definitely. photography is a therapy for you, and um, it is for sure. I don't want to ever risk to have burnout. I don't want to have to push myself into it and then find out it doesn't work, and then and then just say, you know what, I've had enough. I'm out of it. Because yeah. people have done it before. Well, yeah. there is yeah. there is quite a few, isn't there? Just there is, yeah, yep. Completely packed it in. Yeah. What about you guys? Have you guys contemplated going full time or still am? <laughs> still are. <laughs> yeah, still am. Yeah, I think um, it. I think it comes from. It, yeah, for me, it's. I've got completely fed up as to what I do. I mean, I didn't. Okay. I never really wanted to do what I do. I mean, I, I had a music shop for long enough, selling mm -hmm. musical instruments, my own business. And when that went wrong, because of recession hitting, mm -hmm. um, I had to find a job quickly, and that ended up being delivering passports at the time, um, secure mail passports, that sort of thing. And I mm -hmm. thought, right, well, I'll do this for a year until I find something else. And ten years, I'm still doing it. Okay. And I've got to the point now where it's just like, nah, I can't do this much longer. I just can't mm. do it. Mm. So it's mm. it's got to that sort of stage where I'm thinking I, I really need to do something for for me more than anything. As selfish yeah. as that might sound, but I need to I sort know. of, you know, I need to kind of do it for me mentally more than anything. Yeah. For, for my mental yeah. health, if nothing, yep. nothing else. When I do yeah. something that feeds me if that makes sense mm. yeah. yeah the trick is there is you could uh, if if you think that that's what you want to do the most important thing is now and you know whether we've been talking about for the last half an hour is to sort of understand you know what you're going to deliver that other people aren't yeah you know? yeah well this is it mm. Mm. 
Mm. That's that's yeah. the key. That's the key to it all, really. It is. Is it coming is. up with something new. Again, and I think it's like what what Matt said is. Um, <clears throat> I don't necessarily always. I don't necessarily think it has to make, maybe be something new, but just be some be yourself. Yeah, that's right. That's exactly what I was going to say. That's yeah. exactly what I was going to say. It's not about pushing yourself to find something new. It's actually just about being who you are. And I think if you are who you are, you will stand out. Yeah, yeah. yeah. In in the long Definitely. run, I th- I think yeah, you're, yeah, yeah. Because I think if you do try and find you put, you try and find something. Once that peaks, you'll be trying to find. You need to try to find something else, and then, mm. and then it just yeah. goes on and on. But I know what you mean. I know what you mean, Paul. Yeah, you just, yeah. I feel the same way. But mine, I actually, I do actually quite like my job. Um, but uh, still, I, I, there's, there's always that because it's because it's that passion. You just think, ah, mm. oh. um, you know, and, I, and I'm not too good with rules. <laughs> I don't like. Um, obviously, I know we have to follow. I'm not. I'm not a, a rule breaker, a prison rule breaker, or nothing. Mm-hmm. Uh, but um, I, I like. It's kind of like why well, I like being outdoors. I like getting up in the morning. St- stupid o'clock in the morning, just being on my own. Um, yeah, and that's yeah. that's that's my time where you feel like you're the only one there in the world. Yeah. 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 So when you got to do a fifty-hour <clears throat> week. Um, that's obviously out of my control and if you could eliminate that or at least reduce it I feel like you'd be a more complete person shall we say yeah but but, yep. but maybe I wouldn't I don't know it's, mm. it's you know it's all a bit of a pipe dream really you don't know until you do it do you this is the thing no. and no. It's, it's a case of you either do it and um, see what happens or you don't do it and regret it so the ideal yeah. world would be to have a part-time job that sort of supports you financially and you've got that yeah. 20 hours a week to dedicate to photography. Yeah, yeah. I mean, um, I've talked to Paul about before, to my best mates who's in Manchester, Ed Rhodes. He's uh, hmm. he's in construction and he, he works on his own. He's, uh, you know, he does roofing yeah. um, as a carpenter by trade and um, because it's his own business, he sort of just runs his own hours. If he yeah. says, I'm not going to work next week, he doesn't go and he just disappears and spends a week out, you know, going out photographing somewhere and makes money yeah. off the photography too, the lucky bastard. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> he's got it sussed. Yeah, yeah he's got it sussed. <laughs> he has, he has, he has got it sussed, yeah. Beautiful. So you were, um, Tom, you were saying you're from, from yeah. uh, near Dorset. Mm. Yeah, I live near Dorset now. Yeah, okay. Yeah, um, yeah. Obviously, when I lived in Cornwall, uh, I lived in a little place called Bude, which is just about twenty minutes outside of Dartmoor. Okay. Uh, yeah, yeah, so I used to go to Dartmoor quite a lot. Mm. Mm. Um, not necessarily like, like places like Wispens Woods because they were Wispens is kind of like right in the middle. Okay. Uh, so I used to try and I used to, uh, typical me. I I tried and do something different, shoot something where no no one's ever been before, or. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I quite like walking anyway, so mm. I'd quite happily go just go for a walk. If I find some, I find some. It, uh, yeah. But now we live in um, in Wiltshire, which is near Dor- right next to Dorset. So I've got coast. I've got some really good woodlands here. And if I'm honest, I'm only two hours from where I used to be anyway. So that's all right. It's, it's not like you know, Oz or you know or anything mm. where you got to drive three weeks for to sure. the shop. Like mm. yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so it's not really a big up on a deal. Saturday morning. How far away are you from Dirtledore? Uh Probably an hour and 20 minutes, maybe. Oh, okay. If yeah. that, actually. Yeah. If you go early enough, you'd probably do it in an hour. Mm. Yeah, it's not far. Yeah, not far at all. I can remember when I first moved to London, I bought my first camera. I went down a road back then. <coughs> it was on the, on the northern line, the beginning of the northern line in, uh, what's it called, Bridge Road? Not Bridge Road. That's where all the Indian restaurants are. Um, anyway, there was this... This, this major road in London back then, they just had camera shops just everywhere. Um, and um, was it Jessup's, I think was the name Jessup's, of the camera yeah. shops. Yeah, I don't know if they're still around now. Yeah, on the, by the skin of their teeth, yeah. Mm. Yeah, yeah. And I, I don't think, aren't they, no? I, I walked in there and I bought my first camera. I bought a Pentax camera. And um, a couple other mates, got other two mates, they bought themselves a Canon each. 
and we uh, hired a car for the weekend. We travelled down to Dirtledor. That was the first time I ever took an image. That was actually first experience to be out with mates and, and taking landscapes. I had mm. one of those Valbond tripods. It was about a foot and a half high. <laughs> on it. You're laying on the ground. With- <laughs> oh, what a pre- yeah, I got good foreground shots. So I think the first shot I took had a beautiful foreground. <laughs> it was a shame. It was a shame it was taken with film photography because um, yeah, couldn't do any focus stacking back then. So yeah, yeah. yeah. but yeah, it was, that was a beautiful experience. Great way to start off landscape photography with a few friends and and start off doing it together. Yeah, we went yeah. out and bought. We went out and bought a um, uh, a slide projector. Oh, we, all right, put yeah. in, we all put in a, a few quid each and we went back to a house in London and, you know, dimmed the lights at night time and put all the projected all our images up onto the wall and discussed them with each other and thought, hey, you know, I think your, you know, your, your, your white balance is wrong or your, your, your focus is a bit out here or, hey, look at the lens you used, you know. It was, yeah. Yeah, it was, a, it was definitely a good way to start off, I think. Yeah, yeah good I learning like, curve, eh? Yeah, I like the sound of that. Well, it was. So I think I think within probably after about six months, six months of taking landscapes, all three of us we, we were actually back then were getting damn good images because we fed off each other instantly. Um, it was like going on a workshop, sort of to you know to a certain extent. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. Because back then too, you got to remember if you wanted to learn how to 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 take images, you had to either go on a workshop with Joe Cornish. <laughs> um, or and pay a lot of money back then. I mean, he was the, probably the only guy doing it back then in, in the UK. There's probably only a handful, maybe three or four photographers in all of England that were doing workshops back then. Mm. And um, or, or you would bought the amateur photography magazine monthly, and you would wait to like one image to come out and say, "What f stop did he take this image with?" Oh, he took mm. it at f10. Oh, that's amazing. That was how you learnt back then. There was nothing else. They had no other way of. Or you bought a photography book, you know? Yeah, yeah, um, yeah, yeah. Different, yeah, different cool. world. Different world. That was a short. That were my memories of of England back then. Yeah. <laughs> As a twenty three year old yeah, with a Velbon tripod, my God. <laughs> <laughs> are they still? Do they still make tripods? Velbon, oh, yeah, yeah. Oh do, God, yeah. I'm sorry, Velbon. I just bagged the hell out of you. You probably got really good tripods right now, haven't you? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, uh. Yeah. <laughs> no comment. <laughs> no. Okay, just opened up a can of worms, didn't I? Huh? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I know. I well, I've got a Sony R four. Okay. Sixty megapixels. Yeah, and um, mm. the detail is just insane. Oh yeah, definitely. Yeah, I mean, for cropping, right. for cropping and everything, it's definitely. Mm. I can understand having those extra megapixels for for cropping, but I don't. I, I think um, a lot of the times. I mean, I've got the K one. That's thirty six megapixels, and thirty six. Even if I want to crop or own an image for, even for printing, it's um. I mean, yeah. Oh god, I, I know guys out there that print. You know, prints. You know, that are bigger than two meters, and they're using. Um, you know, 25, 26 megapixel cameras. And unless you're actually standing that far away from the canvas, you're not going to tell. No. Um, <clears throat> Especially now with this new Lightroom feature, which kind of makes it all pointless anyway, because this new Lightroom feature basically yeah. enhances all your resolution, doesn't it? It's a bit like, um, what's the name? Topaz Labs. You know, okay. I've heard, heard of Topaz Labs plugins. Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, there's a thing called Gigapixel AI, and that basically doubles your... Well, you can double your resolution or you can triple your resolution. You can make massive files with this thing. Works, okay. I think it works a bit on AI, and it All just right. it takes your original image and just makes it huge. So if you wanted to print huge now, you could get a 16 megapixel camera and and make it, you know, massive enough to print anyway. So I think, to be honest, that's kind of made, made to me, it's made all these massive resolution cameras a bit, what's the point? Hmm. Okay, yeah, I, did, I didn't know about that. I mean, I only use Lightroom for cataloging, so um, yeah. I, don't, yeah, well, I don't look into Lightroom that much, but... Is it Lightroom? No, it might be 
No, it's it's actually what what am I saying? It's in Lightroom. It's actually in uh, Camera Raw. Camera oh, really? Raw, that, yeah. It's in Camera well, it's Raw. It's one of those. It's one of those new filters they've bought out now. Okay. It's uh, yes, yeah, a resolu- resolution filter. I think. It's like okay. it enhances all your resolution. It sounds oh. really interesting. I haven't I haven't used it. I haven't seen it, but it's that's what it's supposed to do. I wonder what I wonder what it actually does. If it's similar to uh, like. Uh, like you post-production pixel shift resolution or something, is it? Or the Bayer system where it actually finds a way of actually replacing a pixel mm. in four different colours to actually... Mm. I, I, I don't know. I'm not That's sure, I'm not yeah. entirely sure see, how it works. It'd be interesting to see how it actually changes the quality of the image, though, wouldn't it? Um, you know, okay. It, it, it might fix the pixel issue up, but it does it, does it affect the actual it's image supposed, quality itself. It's supposed to make the image quality far better. Oh, and from what I've seen, it actually does. I mean, it actually sharpens the image right up. It looks amazing. Okay. Oh, I'm gonna have to have a look at that. Yeah, it I looks really I'll, interesting. I'll be going to bed late tonight. I think. <laughs> <laughs> I've still, I've still got some, I've still got some images I took with the <clears throat> my, with my first digital camera, the 10 megapixel sensor that I want to get back into. So that might be a good idea. Yeah, well, that'll do it. That'll do it. Yeah, yeah, that, yeah that's good. That's a lot of people actually said that. Yeah, there's a lot of people actually said they're using it for that sort of thing. Old images mm. that they had on smaller megapixel cameras that mm. they're, mm. they're mm. blowing up now. So, yeah, it's interesting. For sure. So, so you're so you're based in 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 uh, Italy then? No, at the moment, Matt. I've been here for yeah quite a while. When I was in London, I met an Italian, and uh, after living in London for a year, I. I originally had the plan of leaving London and going to Canada for a year to work. And um, most Australians, when they finish university, they usually spend a year or two traveling overseas and getting drunk and getting laid and going crazy all over the globe. And um, <laughs> <laughs> and um, I yeah, just, I met uh, an Italian, I think it was actually the first day I moved to London. And um, yeah, we basically, have been together now for yeah, almost on 20 years. And we spent a few years in Australia together and we moved back We moved back here um, to be close to her family. So we had um, support to have children. You know, it's important to have your grandparents nearby yeah. Yeah. when you have kids. <clears throat> my, my family live all over Australia. They're, they're sort of everywhere. So it's a bit, it was a bit hard for us to just say, hey, let's bring up a family in Australia and we had no one close to us. So... I've been here for quite a while now. Yeah, mm. yeah, it's a beautiful country to um to be out taking photos. That's for sure. It's <clears throat> some amazing amazing spots to go to, and there's so many picnic destinations that um <laughs> that are actually mind blowing. People that only people that go and have picnics know about, and because it's just there are photographers here, but they all sort of go to the same destinations. There's so many good places to be around here. Right, um, right. Discovering more and more of them now. Um, abandoned castles high up in mountains, um, forests with, um, you know, beach forests that are, you know, you have these trees that are five, six hundred years old. They look like something out of Lord of the Rings. Oh, yeah. um, mm. Great little waterfalls. I've got a waterfall close to my house that nobody knows about. I've had so many people asking me where it is and I don't tell them because it's... Um, the ecosystem's extremely delicate in this waterfall. There's no walking path. There's right. moss everywhere, and the moss is beautiful. And yeah. um, I go to this destination, no one knows about it. And um, that's Italy's full of these places. Yeah, it's beautiful. Yeah, really, it's, yeah, it's a good place. It's a good place to, to photograph in for sure. I mean, you guys are very lucky too. I mean, England has got. Amazing places. I can't wait to get over your way soon, guys. As soon as this lifts, I'm definitely... Yeah, you have to get over here, mate, and we're, um, we'll have to organise something. For sure. Like I said to Paul, as soon as everything opens up, I'm coming over. I would love yeah. to go to Snowdonia. I've been dreaming to go to Snowdonia for years. Yeah, I love and Snowdonia. cancelled Glencoe last year. I really wanted to go to Glencoe because I wanted to find... I'm just... I'm certain that there's destinations in Glencoe that you can photograph that aren't exactly the same ones of mm-hmm. that the waterfall yeah. that Paul knows. I don't know what the name of that waterfall is, but um Fairy Pools. 
So no, no, just no, that's Glenn you know, Co. yeah, in Glen Coe. That's all the oh, Sky Fairy pools, isn't it? Sky, yeah. sorry, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah um, that, yeah, that waterfall's oh, it's, the place is just trashed now. It's, it is. It is. It's just it's heard, like an absolute quagmire. It's just awful. I heard Joe Cornish actually saying that they, they want to try and implement sort of like a boardwalk or something into it, but it's very, very expensive to put these boardwalks in. You're talking about hundreds of thousands of dollars. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. But it's, yeah, it's trashed. It's a shame. Yeah. It's, it's a shame. So many places. You imagine what the US is like. <laughs> We're lucky because yeah, yeah. there's so many places in the US that are completely trashed now. You see images on the internet of these guys getting in front of a destination and be like, 250 tripods all closely knit together to shoot one scene. We don't mm. have that. No, Do we? Thank in God. Europe, that doesn't exist. No. We're no, lucky. No. We're lucky yeah, we are lucky not to have that. Mm, mm, mm. For sure. So, so, so obviously, um, sharing sharing locations is a uh, is quite a hot topic, isn't it? Oh yeah. Yeah. Um, because and and obviously, like me and Paul. Uh, closely work with nature first and, and mm-hmm. trying to promote the, the, the nature first sort of, um, principles. And, uh, yeah. So how, where do you, obviously you stand on the, the fence of not sharing and you want to protect and. Okay. Uh, uh, how do you, where do you, how do you feel about all that? I know it's quite, that's quite a broad question, but, um, just wanted to get like a general feel from you. If I'm going to shoot Fitzroy Mountain in, in El Shell 10 in Patagonia and I know the, that place gets a huge amount of traffic anyway, um, if I don't put the des- name of the destination on there, you're going to know where it is anyway. Um, yeah. So I don't mind too much putting up the name of the destination. Yeah. Um, mm. But if there's somewhere else... Uh, I've got a lot of, there's a lot of spots in Patagonia. I just won't tell people where they are. It's like, okay, if you want to know, come on a workshop with me. Otherwise, you'll never find out. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> I'll do your um, own research. Yeah, yeah, yeah. but uh, no, I tend to I tend to sort of stay away from it now. Like Tuscany is another example. If I'm going to shoot in Tuscany, I'm just going to write Tuscany in there because it's obvious. Yeah. I don't think there's um the, these places the tourism is high anyway, and they can deal with tourism in a way that. Uh, this land isn't going to get affected too much, especially through Tuscany. It's all actually hop out of the car and walk onto the side of the road and pull your tripod out. So those areas don't bother me too much. But like I said, like these little secluded areas that I know are in Italy that not too many people know about, I prefer to keep them for me. It's not being selfish. I don't want to say like, hey, you know, that's my image and I don't want anyone else to have it. I'm actually worried about the delicacy of that little microclimate, that 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 uh, that ecosystem that's in that area, and like I said, this area's got a lot of very delicate, beautiful moss growing off a cliff face, straight up into a waterfall with no footpath. Mm-hmm. And the only way to access this location is to have your hang on, you don't call them gum boots, welly, bo- <laughs> welly boots, is <laughs> to yeah, welly boots. Yeah, is is to actually walk through the waterfall with your with your boots on. Yeah, yeah. You just walk and just stample, just you know, over top of all these these, these beautiful moss areas. And um, if I tell people where that is, um, yeah. there's a lot of a lot of photographers in Italy who know who I am, and if they see me shooting its destination and putting up the name of it, I know that's only going to take ten photographers who know me to go there. And that ten photographers will end up being a hundred, and that hundred will end up being a thousand. And yeah. to have a thousand feet going in there more than once per year, that's going to affect it deeply. And I don't want that to happen. Yeah, yeah. No. No, that's well said. Yeah, yeah. That's kind of what. That's kind of how way I feel as well. Yeah. Um, yeah. But yeah, obviously it is like a them sort of honeypot locations that they're already honeypots, aren't they? Mm. Uh, everybody knows about them. I mean, uh, you know, we're, we're talking about before about Dartmoor, you know, saying I think it's mm. Dart. Is that do I yeah. pronounce it correctly? Dartmoor, yeah. There was a there was a bloke who actually photographed in Dartmoor, and he was so concerned about he wanted that image to be his own. He was so 
he was 100% positive that he was the only one who photographed that tree, that afterwards, this is, this is a, um, uh, what I was told, so it might not be the case, but it's an interesting story to tell, that he actually broke a branch off the tree after he took the image to say, hey, I, I actually got that tree the way it was and now no one can take it again. <laughs> I have heard of that sort of thing happening, to be honest. Yeah, to be fair, I have heard yeah. of it. Yeah. I pulled yeah. up a guy on Instagram a couple of years ago, and um, I won't mention his name because he's a very famous photographer. Um, well, he's a very famous Instagram photographer. Um, <laughs> and he actually put up an image of him and a fellow photographer actually moving a tree that had fallen over into this river in front of a waterfall and it was a very big tree and they chopped the tree down. They actually filmed it on Instagram, um, chopping this tree down and removing it out of the water and moving the rocks out of the way so that their foreground was clean to take an image. And I got, I, I, I got stuck into him on Instagram, yeah. I just I don't accept stuff like that. You know, there's little animals, there's stuff that feeds off that. That's a natural, a natural yeah. event that happens when a tree falls into a water. It gives a food source to another, to another species, and to just go in there and play with things like that to get your image the way you want it, it's just wrong. Yeah. and there's so much of it out there. Oh yeah, definitely trashing mm. habitats, and they, they mm. don't even think twice about it. Though this is the sad part. Mm. 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 No, just no. It's not. Um, it's not. It's not the way to behave, is it? To be honest, you and know. it's sad too because well, I think that a lot of us who actually have this passion, we have this passion because we have such a huge respect, and we feel nature when we're there so much. It becomes part of us, but and to actually destroy that that connection you have to do something so stupid, I don't understand people's thought process to do something like that, why would they do it? Why even bother going to shoot a waterfall if you've just destroyed part of its ecosystem? What yeah. are you actually documenting? Yeah. You know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, it's not, it's not, it's not real life then either, is it? No, you know, no you're alter, not. You're altering the scene yeah. to the point where you're doing that, then mm. surely it's easier to drive an hour further and go to somewhere where it is clean. Yeah, that's okay. right. I'm yeah, sorry, guys. I've been, I've been talking about so much sad stuff on this podcast. <laughs> <laughs> Depressing. We'll never have an earmom again. My God. <laughs> well, you see, part one was all upbeat. This is the sad part. It's just taken yeah, twice so, as long yeah. this, but... <laughs> <laughs> what's, the, what's the up note, guys? <laughs> Well, let's 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 finish on an up note then, shall we? Let's let's who, if you could mention, maybe a certain photographer or location or a certain something that happened in your life. What what would that be that's given you inspiration to do what you do now? Is there is there a, a location or something that you sort of think, oh, I must do that, on, and that's where you are now, or? Um, look, uh, Patagonia's given me so much. Um, I, I'm lucky that I, as I said before, that I've got you know, one of my best friends who's got his own tour company there and he is known that place for like 25 years and Patagonia's a huge piece of land and he knows every single corner of it and to actually um, be part of the land there and 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 feel... feel Part of actual the culture too when you're there is amazing, and, and, and Patagonia's given me so much because of that. Uh, that's something I've that sort of um, gotten recent years. Um, but the thing that keeps me all, sort of I don't get enough of is to actually capture the landscapes at home in Australia. We've got beautiful, beautiful landscapes, and unfortunately, I don't. I haven't been home in two years now with with this COVID situation, but um. Uh, I actually love when I go home to go out and um, and capture capture those landscapes, capture those scenes that I remember saw when I was a kid, and to yeah. actually capture them as an adult. You know, I used to spend so much time um, walking the beach and walking through forests, you know, playing 
army with my friends and all that sort of stuff and then going back and seeing these spots and capturing it's a beautiful beautiful feeling um yeah, yeah. as far as a person uh, as an inspiration <clears throat> that's what you mean as someone who is yeah an yeah maybe yeah i don't know if you had like, a... I, I've, I've said this more on more than one occasion on, on various channels but i think as far as um um an inspiration as a photographer um, I definitely think that um, probably Joe Cornish would be um, my biggest inspiration as a photographer. Uh, mm. I, remember that, I remember seeing that guy's work when I first started out and I learnt a lot of things off, off his imagery early on and still today. Um, I've been recently going back and I've read one of his books again, which is a really interesting read, guys. If, you, mm. if you're looking for a book, it's called First Light. It was a book he wrote, I think it was back in about, yeah, about 2002, 2003. Same time we got into photography. Yeah. Um, uh, he not only is a brilliant photographer who captures everything in, in its most natural form possible, but he's uh, thought process and poetry and beauty behind the whole philosophy behind photography is, is very, very inspiring. Just to hear that man talk about photography is beautiful and especially when I'm feeling down the dumps about something, if yeah. I get out, get out his book, look at his images, listen to a conversation he had on a podcast or something, it always revives me. Yeah, yeah. he's definitely, definitely a big inspiration, that guy. Yeah, 100%. And he's he's cool. for, Sorry, what was that, mate? I was say, he's got one of the voices, isn't he, as well? Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. And it yeah. Beautiful, very, very well spoken. Um, yeah. He was saying that uh, back when he was, uh, he was a very, very shy um, as a child, and yeah. um, but he had a very strong connection with arts and also with, with English. He was a very good writer um, and... And you can see that in his books, especially in the way he talks, he yeah. just knows how to. He, he he's a poet as as yeah. well as a photographer, and you can see yeah. that poetry behind his imagery. It's yeah, beautiful. Yeah, hundred percent. Yeah, you definitely took poet poetry out. Was well, that's what exactly what I was thinking? He talks. He talks very much like in poetry. Yeah, yeah. It's yeah. it's actually interesting. Um, it's an interesting thing to try. I don't know if you guys have ever tried it before. Um. When you take an image, try and, you know, when you're out somewhere and you're, you're about to you press the camera, try and understand what you feel about that place and look around, look at the, at, at, at what the, um, the elements of that landscape and how it speaks to you and try and put some yeah. poetry to it, try and put something to it. I always, when I put, I don't know if you guys have noticed, if I ever put up an image on social media, I've always got a few words I put behind it. I think it's nice to be able to express yeah. it in words too. Yeah, yeah that's definitely something maybe that. a, something I need to work on maybe, yeah, it's like yeah, like a title or a, just a little bit of something to go with it. Just It just gives you your explanation of what you want to try and bring across. Yeah. Yeah. Rather than just putting an image there and just say, hey, guys, this is a shot I took, you know, in um, – uh, in Iceland last year of a waterfall, at, uh, you know, at 14 millimetres at ISO 100 and it was great being with Joe and Bill and Frank yeah. and we had fun and all that. It's nice to be able to to put something behind that image, you know, what you yeah. felt about it. Mm. Yeah. yeah. So well, just, just to finish quickly, I just wanted to know if there's anyone else, anyone you would recommend, anyone you feel like we must talk to in, in the future. Um, I think there's a lot of um, a lot of photographers in the United States who are people who listen to podcasts. I think they've sort of a lot of them are being covered. Um, yeah, you know, th there is obviously a lot of guys coming out that are um, really really good. But I think that the you know there's a lot of European top uh, photographers that deserve more exposure, and there's some beautiful photographers out there. Um, I would love, but I don't know if he would do it. He's too shy. My mate Ed Rhodes, that guy's just um he's been photographing forever. If you could get him up on there, if I could talk yeah. him into it. Yeah. He, the great guy to talk to. Um I would yeah, guys, I would focus on some photographers in Europe because there's some beautiful photographers there. Um some great Italian photographers too. Um 
Yeah, um, there's so many, so many. I would actually like to hear Neil Bernal come up on a podcast too. Yeah, I, I would like really, to hear Neil. Really, really, really love that guy's work. <laughs> you can yeah, see yeah. his images from a mile away. Like we were saying before, he's 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 got a location that is basically his. I mean, it's he, he, he owns that place by the way he captures it and the light he captures it in and... Um, I could just look at those images over and over again. I'd like to hear him talk about that more. Yeah, um, yeah, that'd be a good that'd be a good topic. Yeah, yeah, good. definitely. Ed's another great guy to talk to too because he's got so much experience in photography. He's been shooting for even longer than I have, and um, but you know he he's got a, a business behind photography, and um, it's good to to be able to chat about how he actually shoots on field when he shoots on field he knows when he takes an image whether that's going to make some money for him or not i think he'd be a good guy he's got a really really interesting way of doing it his compositions he knows how to to if he's out somewhere i might be you know getting some extreme foreground with some flowers in the foreground with a waterfall coming through from the right to the, the center of the image and he's got it turned his camera around in portrait mode and he's taking it over there. And I'm like, Ed, what are you doing, mate? And he's going, no, no, this is going to sell. It's for magazine cover. You know, the writing's on the left-hand side, the heading's across the top, it just fits perfectly. Um, that guy's he's got it all up in his head and um, he'd be a good bloke to talk to because there's not many photographers out there that, that have that mindset, people that yeah. are, mm. you know, working in it as a respected profession, um, people that don't. He does it for fun, but people that do it for a job too, it's, um, yeah. it's important to to listen to these guys and see what they have to say. <clears throat> yeah, yeah, definitely, sure. yeah. Mm. We best finish that. Well, thanks very much for coming on, mate. I uh, really appreciate it. Thanks, and, guys. Um, thanks for hearing me uh, ramble on for an hour. Um, <laughs> 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 it's been fun, mate. It's been fun. And what we'll it do is, is we'll, we'll put all your links and information down in, des- in the description below. Yeah, um, and the link to the last one as well, which is part one. And uh, it's great to have you on. Thanks very much for yeah. coming. No Cheers, worries. Mate. Thank Thanks, you, buddy. Go on. Cheers, mate. Watching this, then I assume you're someone who is passionate about both photography and the natural world. Over the last decade, I'm sure you've seen the incredible growth in photography. Everyone has a camera these days, and everyone wants a beautiful nature photo to share with the world. Unfortunately, the passion to capture that image often overrides thoughtfulness. Wildflower fields are being trampled and destroyed. Delicate, unknown locations are being widely advertised, bringing crowds of people, transforming wild places into urban spaces. Regulations, private property, and the well-being of wildlife are ignored in the pursuit of an image for Instagram. If such things weigh heavily on you, consider joining Nature First, the movement for responsible nature photography. This is a global initiative to help recover the role of nature photographers as caretakers and ambassadors of the natural world. There are no membership fees, no ads, no gimmicks, just an opportunity to be part of this global initiative of nature photographers dedicated to caring for the natural world. You can learn more at naturefirstphotography.org.